Welcome to episode 13, the Green Financing for Building Green 2022, the Digital Conference. Building Green is the flagship campaign for Phil GBC events and consists of year-round activities that encourage participation in the green building advocacy. I am Chester De La Cruz from the Phil GBC National Secretariat and will be today's facilitator. So thank you to the Phil GBC Board of Trustees for initiating this event. Our Chair, Mr. Edgar Sabidong, Vice President and Chief Sustainability Officer of Artha Land Corporation. Our Vice Chair, Ms. Rowena Ramos, Principal of Ecotectonica Inc. Secretary, Ms. Elizabeth Mendoza, Managing Director of Monocrete Construction Philippines. Our Treasurer, Mr. Ramon Rufino, CEO of Neo Property Management Inc. The members of the board, Ms. Catherine Ilagan, President and COO of PhilInvest Alabang Inc., Mr. Felino Palafox Jr., Principal Palafox Ad Associates, Mr. Hener Liwanag, Junior Partner of GF and Partners Architects, Mr. Luis Chamon, Country Manager, San Goban, Philippines, Ms. Audrey Belpo, Director and uh, Managing Director of uh, World Home Depot Corporation, Mr. Francisco Arellano, Consultant of Mainilad Water Services, and Mr. Maria Gabriel Angelo Cascante um, from the Phil GBC Board. I also would like to acknowledge the CEO of the Phil GBC, Mr. Christopher De La Cruz, and the Executive Director, Ms. Anna Tungol, and the Phil GBC National Secretariat for organizing this conference. We also would like to thank our sustaining corporate sponsors that support the programs of the Phil GBC and for making our activities possible. Our Diamond Sustaining Sponsor, Neo Property Management Inc., our Gold Sustaining Sponsor, Wall Vision Corporation, and our Silver Sustaining Sponsors, Artha Land Corporation, Daikin Air Conditioning Philippines Inc., Ecotectonica, Firefly Electric and Lighting Corporation, GF and Partners Architects, Gigatech Inc., KPI Elevators Inc., Monocrete Construction Philippines Inc., San Goban Philippines, SMCC Philippines, Surface Repair Solutions, and World Home Depot Corporation. We would like to thank the following sponsors and strategic partners for their support in making this Building Green Conference 2022 possible. Our Diamond Sustaining Sponsor and National Secretary Sponsor, Neo Property Management Inc., our Gold Sustaining Sponsor, Wall Vision Corporation, and our Building Green 2022 Gold Strategic Partners, Aboitis Infra Capital Economic Estates, City, Home Bu City Homes Builder and Development Inc., our Building Green 2022 Silver Strategic Partners, First Balfour, Daikin Air Conditioning Philippines, and Wall Vision Corporation. We also have our Building Green 2022 Bronze Strategic Partners, AGC Asia Pacific Botanic and Nature Residences, PhilInvest City, Datem Incorporated, FPD Asia Property Services, and Monocrete Construction Philippines. So before we continue, Please be reminded of the following event guidelines. So this webinar will be recorded by the Phil GBC National Secretariat for documentation purposes. We encourage active participation during the event. You may ask your questions using the question box in the GoToWebinar panel. Questions that you will raise will be addressed during the discussion period. Upon request, an electronic certificate of attendance will be issued by the Phil GBC National Secretariat to your registered email addresses, provided that you are present for more than 50% of the allotted time for each session, also that you have completed the feedback survey, which will be sent to your registered email after the event. And of course, you must request a copy of your certificate through events at philgbc.org. We believe we can do well by doing green. As green financial instruments permeate the market, we need a comprehensive understanding on how these instruments help us in investing in our next green building. In this episode of Building Green 2022, episode 13, the green financing, leading government and financial institutions with the mandate to continually support green transformation in the market 
will be presenting their financing options that are available and how these support sustainable development goals. In this episode, we will have presentations from the different financial institutions, including presentations from Mr. Nolly, I mean, or Mr. Rustico Nolly D. Cruz, who is currently the Vice President and the Head of the Program Development and the Management Department of the Development Bank of the Philippines that is responsible for the management and implementation of various programs and projects related to infrastructure, environment and social services, and community development. He has more than 28 years of experience in development banking, with 10 years of which as an account officer handling renewable energy projects and micro, small, and medium enterprises. He has been program manager of various projects funded by multilateral and bilateral institutions such as the World Bank and the Japan International Cooperation Agency, particularly on sectors and programs concerning renewable energy, water supply and sanitation, climate change adaptation and mitigation. Mr. Cruz is a licensed environmental planner, a certified green finance specialist, and holds degree, a degree in Master's in Business Administration. We also have Mr. Ronald or Ronaldo Oni Averion. He's the head of the Renewable Energy Team of the Program Management Department of Land Bank of the Philippines. Mr. Averion has been with Land Bank for 27 years and was previously involved with banking automation, asset and liability management, special projects and development assistance. In his current capacity as the head of Renewable Energy Team, He's handling technical evaluation of renewable energy and energy efficiency proposals for loan financing. Mr. Averion is a graduate of business administration, major in finance, and has a master's in business Admi administration degree from the Ateneo de Manila University. We also have engineer Maria Imelda Pabros. She's the department manager uh, of the property valuation department of the home Development Mutual Fund or Pag-ibig Fund. Engineer Fabros graduated with Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering at St. Louis College in San Fernando City, La Union in 1990. Received an academic honor as State Scholar, Academic Excellence and Leadership Awards. She also graduated with a degree in Bachelor of Laws at Don Mariano Marcos Memorial State University, College of Law in 1997 and a master's degree in development administration at Don Mariano Marcos Memorial State University Graduate School in 2003. In 2010, she graduated with uh, she graduated under the management development program at the UP Diliman where she also received an academic honor as valedictorian. Currently, engineer Fabros is taking her doctor of philosophy in management at St. Louis College graduate school. Next would be our speaker, Mr. Trey Archer, Business Development Director for Asia at Gresby. Trey moved to China after graduating from university in the U.S. and has lived in Asia ever since. He was first introduced to ESG during his MBA studies in 2016, where he took courses on sustainability and CSR. After discovering a moral desire, to be part of his new sustainable world, he decided to get more involved in ESG and reoriented his career from asset management to renewable energy, taking on the role of sales manager at Information, a leading data provider for infrastructure and renewable energy project finance. Later, he dived deeper into the world of ESG and joined Gresby the world leader in ESG benchmarking and rating for real assets by directing the, com the company's growing business development efforts in Asia. Trey holds an MBA for, uh, from Holt International Business School and a, a BA in International Relations from George Washington University. Has visited more than 100 countries and is fluent in English, Mandarin, Spanish, and Portuguese. So we will be opening the floor for questions after pre the presentations from our speakers. You may send in your questions for our speakers using the questions, questions box and will be addressed during the open forum. 
uh, Ms. Catherine Ilagan, the member of the Phil JBC Board of Trustees, will be delivering this episode's closing remarks. So to begin with the presentations, we have uh, a presentation for DBP's Green Finance Programs. We have Mr. Rustico Noli Cruz, Vice President and Head of the uh, Program Development and Management Department uh, from the Development Bank of the Philippines. Mr. Noli Cruz, sir. Thank you, Chester, and good morning to everyone, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, I hope we are safe in our respective homes. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you clearly. Okay. Um, all I can say, climate change is real as to what we are experiencing now, and thus we have to do more of green projects. So I hope we are all safe in our respective places no, as uh, I begin my presentation. So next slide, please. So this is just an outline of my presentation. I'd like to talk about the BP first and then the green financing programs that we have as well as the corporate social responsibilities as how it, it links also to the sustainable development goals. And finally, on the uh, E2C uh, financing program, which tackles energy efficiency and some of the uh, renewable energy projects that uh, we could finance. So next slide, please. So TBP is 100% owned by the Philippine government. Uh, and is one of the premier development financial institution in the Philippines. The bank has more than 75 years history in supporting countrywide development and has remained steadfast in its commitment to support the government's various development initiatives. As a key player in nation building, DBP supports the development of the economy through the provision of much needed financing resources to identified priority sectors for sustainable growth. DBP is the sixth largest bank in the Philippines in terms of asset size at uh, 1.15 trillion pesos or 20.68 billion US dollars. So the bank is a recipient of various national and international awards such as the Association of Development Finance in, uh, Institution in Asia and the Pacific as well as the Karlsruhe. And our strength as a development bank is in providing medium to long-term financing and to date DBP has a nationwide network of 131 um, branches, 12 branch type offices, five provincial lending groups, and 32 lending centers. So next slide, please. So for more than seven decades, DBP has firmly supported the Philippine uh, National Government's uh, Development Trust. We remain unswerving in our efforts to help shape the country's economic landscape with our continuing pursuit of growth in strategic and critical sectors of society, particularly infrastructure and logistics, environmental responsibility and preservation, social services and community development, and micro and small medium enterprises. As a development financing developmental and financing institution, DBP serves as a catalyst for balanced, sustainable, and inclusive growth. Our operations and lending activities answer the call to action as urgently articulate in the 17 Sustainable Development Goals to end poverty, promote inclusiveness, build peaceful societies, and protect the planet. Our sustainable development objectives also align with the Philippine Development Plan 2017-2022, which aims to enhance the social public supported by the foundation of peace and security, strategic infrastructure development, safe and resilient communities, ecological integrity, and clean and healthy environment. So next slide, please. So this is our programs uh, that supports our infrastructure and logistics uh, trust as aligned with the national government as well as with the SDG. As you can see on your left uh, side of the screen, these are the specific SDGs that are uh, su being supported by these different programs. So we have the ICONS program that support contractors in building up uh, most of the infrastructure, again, for uh, supporting the sustainable cities. FUSE program uh, supports uh, the utility scale, um, energy generation, particularly on renewable energy, 
as well as on energy efficiency of the utilities on uh, power distribution projects. Cruise program is on the supporting uh, logistics and transport system, uh, of course, with a play more on uh, greening those uh, transport system. The Pasada program, which we have uh, already supported more than 100 of uh, electric vehicles, this is uh, supporting the public utility vehicle modernization program of the national government uh, for more efficient and safe uh, transportation. The DBP Minda uh, supports the Mindanao uh, projects, and uh, this is more on irrigation and uh, potable water. Also for the Delta P and uh, we have a new product called the Solar Merchant Power Pro uh, Power Project or Power Program, where we support now uh, utility scale solar uh, with that is connected to the WSM or that uh, are selling to the WSM. So this is a new product that we have that we could already support uh, solar merchant developers. Next slide, please. For the environment and climate change, uh, we have this uh, E2C, which uh, th there would be an audiovisual presentation later on. And we have the green financing program, which covers uh, both environment and climate adaptation and uh, mitigation projects. We have also these uh, lending initiatives for sanitation program, which is dedicated in supporting the government in terms of septage and sewerage uh, projects in the cleaning up the water bodies, uh, particularly uh, supporting also the different laws, uh, the Supreme Court mandamus, as well as the um, Clean Water Act. We have also Water for Every Resident. This is supporting uh, LGU's uh, water districts, also the private uh, water service providers and other private uh, concessioner for level three water supply system. So next slide, please. For social services and community development, uh, we are supporting Basically, uh, we have for the LGUs in itself in their economic and social development. We have for housing, we um, promote more of uh, green housing. So, and also for schools under our Escuela program. And we have our uh, SHIELD program for hospitals and solid and hazardous waste for uh, SWIP program or the sustainable waste management for enhanced environmental protection and for calamities like this that we are experiencing we have what we call the dbp response program next slide please so for micro small and medium enterprises uh, these are the focused area we are more on the agricultural side but more on the uh, uh, post-harvest facility. So we have also the agroforestry plantation program where we have a um, for plantation of the different trees, no? and then the broiler contract growing program, the ARCA RCEP that is for rice, and the rapid growth for SMEs, and uh, also for rediscounting line for wholesaling, uh, the swine iron tree uh, as the term uh, used, no? swine and then the soft daily. So next slide, please. We have also the corporate social responsibility where we have for scholarship, and this is the rice or resource for inclusive and uh, sustainable education. Uh, more than thousand of uh, uh, students were already supported by this uh, program. And uh, we're happy no, that uh, through this program, we are able to support them. Uh, also, for the DBP Forest Program, this is our CSR for reforestation. We have partnered with the different LGUs, water districts, in their, and also POs, no, uh, or, or, or what we call the, the people's organization in the area where we were able to help them to plant trees as well as fruit trees and uh, indigenous trees, including bamboo species. So next slide, please. 
May I invite you now for an audiovisual presentation of the Energy Efficiency Saving Financing Program. The DBP Energy Efficiency Savings or e to save Financing Program was designed in support of RA11285 or Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act, aimed to institutionalize energy efficiency and conservation as a national way of life. Further, the program support RA9513 or Renewable Energy Act of 2008 in the promotion of the development, utilization, and commercialization of renewable energy resources such as solar rooftop technology. By harnessing new technologies, e to save is expected to improve productivity of public and private institutions and thus promote the efficient and judicious utilization of energy. One of the objectives of the program is to provide credit assistance to both public and private sectors energy efficiency and renewable energy projects for own use or net metering scheme to enable them to harness the available new technologies and energy potentials to help contribute in the effort of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And to provide credit assistance to energy service companies or ESCOs or energy service providers or ESPs to further promote the development of energy efficiency and renewable energy projects. Goals and target of the DBP's e to save program is based on the objectives and international commitment as laid out in the Philippine Development Plan, Sustainable Development Goals, and Paris Agreement on Climate Change and others. These are the salient features of the e to save program. The program caters to public sectors such as, but not limited to the following, national government agencies, government-owned and controlled corporations, state universities and colleges, and local government units, private companies, and energy service companies certified or registered by the Department of Energy, or energy service providers. The program covers the replacement and installation of highly efficient mechanical, electrical, and industrial equipment such as but not limited to the following, lighting, motor pumps, boilers, kilns, heat exchanger, chillers, heating, air conditioning, and ventilation, recovery, and utilization of byproduct gas waste and pressure, industrial process improvement and system optimization, preparation of energy audit or investment grade audit report for public institutions, and installation of solar rooftop or ground mounted for own use or net metering scheme. TPP offers short-term loan such as ESCO's purchase order and energy savings performance contract receivables. Liquidity and working capital requirements. Trade financing. Import letter of credit for machineries and equipment. While for long-term loan, it includes capital expenditures of public and private institutions. Multi-year energy service performance contracts of ESCOs and investment grade audit or energy audit for public institutions. To encourage investments in energy efficiency and renewable energy projects for own use or net metering scheme, DBP can finance 100% of the acceptable total project cost for public institutions. While for private companies, the maximum loanable amount is up to 80% of the validated total project cost. 
and for ESCOs and ESPs, the maximum loanable amount is up to 80% of the contract or PO amount, net of margin. The repayment terms for short-term loan is up to one year, while for long-term loan, it's up to 10 years, inclusive of one-year grace period on principal. While interest rate can be fixed or variable based on the prevailing market rate, The other special features of the program are Project financing or collateral based on project assets may be allowed for client with proven track record, profitable operation for the last three years or listed companies. Repayment based on savings for energy efficiency and renewable energy projects may be allowed. Loan amortization may be designed based on the 80% of monthly savings or revenues, or depending on the client's preference, provided that low tenor shall not exceed 10 years. Also, omnibus term loan facility covering two years pipeline projects may be offered, where cost validation shall be made as pre-release condition. These are the financial and technical considerations under e to save Under the 5 C's of credit, it includes character, in which the proponent should have no adverse findings, not on the negative list of borrowers and loan, and not on the list of PNP or PDEA most wanted person. Capacity in which repayment source is clearly defined, track record of at least three-year profitable operation except for startups, debt service cover of at least 1.0, for collateral with acceptable collateral security, for condition with positive or favorable outlook of the clients and their project industry, And lastly, capital, with applicable debt equity ratio. These are the parameters that the DPP is looking at for the viability of energy efficiency projects. For potential savings, an investment grade audit or energy audit must be conducted. For equipment, it should follow the minimum energy performance for products set by the DOE for energy consuming products. For energy savings performance contract, the estimated energy and cost savings should be guaranteed by the ESCOs. Liquidated damages, operations, and maintenance period should be indicated in the contract. Energy service companies with proven performance or results-based project savings experience and with proven customers' experiences. For monitoring and verification, there should be a good MNV plan to determine the actual savings. For the technical viability of renewable energy projects, this include the following. Area requirement. As a rule of thumb, there should be 10 square meters for 1 kilowatt solar PV system capacity. The space between panels and roof should be at least 4 inches. It should be free from shading to harness the full potential of the system. For inclination and orientation of the panels, Solar panels should be installed facing south. The ideal tilt of the solar panels should be at 10 to 15 degrees angle. 
For the appropriate sizing, it should be sized according to average monthly electricity consumption from the electricity bill, or compute for the electricity consumption of all the equipment used. For potential electricity to be generated, performance ratio should be at least 75% and above, and preferably guaranteed by the service provider. Module degradation should not exceed 2% on the first year of operation and 1% on the remaining years. For the equipment, the main equipment such as solar panels and inverters should come from a reputable manufacturer. And lastly, contractor with reputable track record and quality workmanship. This is the process flow on availing loans. The first stage is the target marketing phase in which the proponent shall complete and submit all the documentary requirements. For second stage, which is the credit initiation phase, the DBP's account officer or account officer assistant will request credit investigation and collateral appraisal to the DBP's Property Appraisal Credit Investigation Department or Property Appraisal and Credit Investigation Field Team and prepare a credit proposal for the approval of the DBP's approving authority. For the third stage or the approval phase, this is the phase where the credit proposal may be approved or disapproved. The account officer or account officer assistant will send a notice of approval or disapproval. If this approved, the document submitted will be returned to the proponent. While if the loan is approved, the proponent will proceed with the documentation phase or the fourth stage, which is the signing of the loan documents such as loan agreement and legal documents. And finally, the fifth stage which is the implementation phase, the loan releasing, and submission of pre-release documents. For turnaround time, the loan processing may take up to 45 to 65 working days upon submission of the complete documentary requirements. For more information, please contact the following. So that's the uh, A2 Save program, and thank you very much for your attention. So I just would like to point out that our E2 Save is now being enhanced to include green building projects and electric vehicles. Uh, currently, these projects are eligible under our green financing program, but uh, we intend that the green financing program will be an umbrella program for advocacy. So uh, if you'd like to avail of the green building part, uh, or green building uh, financing, uh, please come to DBP, as well as if you have some uh, electric vehicle projects. No? So please come to DBP. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Cruz. And thank you for sharing that update that you have already included green buildings as part of the E2Safe program. Thank you, sir. So our next presenter is Mr. Ronald Averion, the program officer from the Program Management Department of Land Bank of the Philippines to share on Landmass Go Green Inclusive Financing Program. I'll pass now the controls to you, Mr. Averion. Hi, good morning, everyone. I hope uh, everyone is safe. Uh, can you hear me clearly, Chester? Yes, sir. Good morning. We can All hear right. you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, and good morning again. So uh, I will not focus on uh, Landmass as, as an institution, but rather on the Land Bank's Go Green Inclusive Financing Program. So um, when, 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 we, when this program was conceptualized, uh, Land Bank has in its mind, um, we want to invigorate the drive towards financing clean sources of energy as the bank support 
to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, particularly on ensuring accessible clean energy and the need to take urgent action in addressing climate change. Second, we want to promote and encourage development of renewable energy sources and the adoption of energy efficient technologies and solutions for a reliable, clean, and sustainable power. Third, we want to provide financing to power, financing to power consumers to adopt energy efficient solutions that will translate to lower electricity consumption and generate savings on power costs. So that's why we have the Land Bank Go Green Inclusive Financing Program. So what are the details of this program? Next slide, please. Okay, so the Go Green program is eligible to first the LGUs. We, uh, Go Green program is also available to single proprietorship, partnership, cooperatives, and corporations. We also made this program available to state universities and colleges, local universities, and also private universities and colleges, and also to GOCCs. Next slide. So for eligible projects, we can finance the installation of rooftop, solar energy system, windmill, turbine systems, and a hybrid energy generator. We can also finance waste to energy conversion. We can also finance thermal insulation and heat exchange systems, roof wall heat insulation, light reflected coatings, materials for buildings, installation of energy efficient exosystem, solar water heaters. We can also finance the installation of energy efficient system and equipment like industrial high efficiency motors, inverter type air conditioning system, automation of high energy equipment like escalators, blowers, etc., etc. We can also finance energy efficient lighting. We can also finance rain collection or water cycling systems and green buildings, among others. Next, what are the loan features of the Grow Green, Go Green program? First, it is for the acquisition, construction, installation of equipment, systems, appliances, building materials, structures that will result in efficient and cost-effective use of energy or electricity translating into a significant reduction in electricity bills of the borrower or the proponent. It is a term loan which can run up to 15 years and land bank finance up to 90% of the total project cost. Next slide. The interest rate is uh, based on market but would not be but is not low but cannot be lower than 5% per annum for penalty for a corporation that would be 24% per annum but for cooperatives it would only be 3% per annum next slide as i said earlier the maximum period of repayment can be up to 15 years or based on cash flow or the economic useful life of the project to be financed or the instrument or the equipment to be financed collateral would be um, the equipment itself the object of financing or it could also be in the combination of real estate mortgage shuttle mortgage and other collaterals acceptable to land bank. next slide please For documentary requirements, of course, uh, we should have a uh, loan application and the business registration of the proponent, the personal information of the borrowers, details of the project, the financial projections and cost savings projections, contracts, 
like in the engineering procurement and construction contract, any cost savings computation, of course, the permits and licenses, audited financial, uh, financial statements for the last three years, and in case of local government units, monetary board opinion. Next slide. Other uh, documentary requirements could include the applicable insurance coverage for the project and uh, other collateral documents for the requ uh, required collateral. Next slide, please. Uh, before I end, uh, this is a quick presentation. Uh, we, we, I just want, would like to impress upon everyone that Land Bank is more than just farmers and fisher folks. As a universal bank, land bank is present in all industries and in all sectors of the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ronald Averion. And then for our next speaker to present on Pag-ibig Fund's green financing programs, we have uh, engineer Maria Imelda Pabros, Department Manager, Property Valuation Department of Pag-ibig Fund. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, before I proceed, I would just like to thank the Philippine Green Building Council for inviting us uh, this morning to talk about the programs that we have in relation to um, our advocacy to promote um, green uh, features. So as a background, as a background, Pag-ibig Fund in its revised manual on real estate appraisal and enhancement to the revised appraisal manual have both incorporated factors relative to green building climate change and disaster resiliency in appraisal valuation. So under this, we have an up to 20% adjustment on our appraised value based on applicable factors present in subject property. For the positive factors, we include energy efficiency, water efficiency, solid waste management, and site sustainability. For the negative factors, we include fumes, smoke, and other toxic wastes from nearby factory, industrial dust, proximity to garbage dump sites, along lower path flows, near river banks and floodplains, prone to flooding, proximity to landslides, radiation, and proximity to fault lines. We also have a policy on the availment of a big housing loan for the acquisition and installation of solar panels, which allows the acquisition and installation of solar panels as part of home improvement or as a component of the housing unit to be purchased subject to the prevailing Pagibig Fund retail housing loan programs. The loan shall be secured by a collateral that shall consist of the same residential property to which the loan proceeds are applied. And under Pag-ibig Funds 2018 to 2022 Strategic Plan, environment-friendly programs on Pag-ibig-led projects are also included, and it aims to have approved a number of housing projects as um, stated here in the matrix for 2018 to 2022 we have a total of 18 projects um project as projected but in actuality we have exceeded uh this projected housing projects approved green building is now widely used and implemented in our country and worldwide even a number of developers have been including some features of green building 
and technology in their projects. Pag-ibig Fund, in its part, recognizes the importance of green technology by including it in the valuation and evaluation of properties, including pag-ibig financed projects. Green building is the practice of adopting measures that promote resource management efficiency and site sustainability while minimizing the negative impact of the buildings on human health and environment. This practice complements the conventional building design concerns of economy, durability, serviceability, and comfort. For the Philippine Green Building Code, um, it is the referral code of the National Building Code. It was approved by the Department of Public Works and Highways to uh, Secretary Huelio L. Singson on June, 20, June 22, 2015. The provisions of the Green Building Code shall apply to all new construction and or with alteration of buildings and the required minimum to total gross floor area for a residential dwelling condominium is 20,000 square meters. And for a mixed use occupancy, it is 10,000 square meters. The total gross floor area is the sum of the dwelling areas, common and accessory areas within the building. The office of the building official shall review the building permit application for green buildings as prepared by the design professionals in compliance with the requirements of the Green Building Code. For, our, for the performance standards, uh, which are considered in the evaluation process, as mentioned um, a while ago, there are any energy efficiency, water efficiency, solid waste management, and site sustainability. For the energy efficiency, it requires the adoption of efficient practices, designs, methods, and technologies that reduce energy consumption, resulting in cost savings. For the water efficiency, it requires the adoption of efficient practices, plan, design, materials, textures, equipment, and methods that reduce water consumption resulting in cost savings. And for the sol solid waste management, it requires the adoption of efficient waste management practices and use of eco-friendly materials. And for site sustainability, it requires the adoption of planning, design, construction, and operation practices that minimize the adverse impact of buildings on ecosystems and water resources. So here we have examples of energy efficiency, like the Swedic building in Makati City, which um, adopts an energy efficient full length aluminum glass curtain wall. Next is um, steel under energy efficiency. We have the Tivoli Garden Residences in Mandaluyong which adopts um, a natural ventilation um, feature. This measure will give building um, occupants the flexibility and opportunity to use natural ventilation for free cooling and fresh air in regularly occupied spaces. So for every five floors, they have um, um, pocket gardens and they have a free flow of natural light and air. Um, so we also have uh, features for a mechanical system, which in may include air conditioning system, water heating system, and variable speed drives and high efficiency motors. Still under the energy efficiency, we also have electrical system, such as daylight provision. So we have the windows, skylight, terrestrial, and light scoop, which um, 
allows um, daylight provision for buildings. So daylight um, daylight is provided or allowed into the room space. For occupancy sensors for lighting control, uh, these are examples of these are covered car parks where lighting is being controlled by the occupancy sensors. So under daylight controls lighting system, auto-electric sensors connected to luminaires help in dimming or switching off lamps that do not require to be operated due to presence of adequate daylight. Um, under still under the energy efficiency, we also in, um, consider inverter charger, lithium ion battery, double throw switch, DC breaker, mounting mountings and cables for solar panels, wind energy and hydro energy features. So an example, this is our project in Via Verde in San Vicente, Santo Tomas, Batangas which has a provision for solar panel system. Now under water efficiency, we have uh, water fixtures, which allows um, efficiency in water supply or use. So examples of this are dual flush water closets, water closets with sink, waterless urinals, and low-flow shower heads. And then still under water efficiency, we have water management. Uh, examples of this are rain water harvesting system and water recycling system. Now for the solid, solid waste management, an example of this is the material recovery facility. So the solid waste containers are provided for at least four types of waste, like compostable, non-recyclable, recyclable, and special waste. And for the site sustainability, we consider the open space utilization. So there's a provision of green areas like vegetated roof deck, landscape areas, wall-mounted plants and vegetation, and plant boxes. Now, here are other sample of subdivision projects with green features in NCR. So first is the Araya Park Residences. It is located at um, Barangay Tagapo, Santa Rosa, Laguna. So for here, the positive factors are the solar panel energy system and housing units, sewage treatment facility, and the multi-parks and playground. Another project is the Ami Araya Highlands, which is located at San Mateo Rizal. The positive factors here are the site sustainability and land development, energy efficiency due to natural ventilation and housing units, and water efficiency on use of water efficient fixture. We also have the Sterling Residences One, which is located at Naik Cavite. The positive factors are providing, providing energy efficient street lights, using efficient building components like operable windows and balcony door openings for natural ventilation, and energy efficient lighting fixtures, and using water efficient toilet fixtures. We also have the first part home stands of phase 1A, 1B, 2A, 
2B and 3. This is located at Tansa Cavite. Um, the positive factor is the provision of site-sustainable green areas and the use of water-efficient toilet fixtures. And we also have the Tansa Garden Premier Phase 2 and 3, which is located at Tansa Cavite. The positive factors are the provision of site-sustainable green areas and water recycling facility, and also the use of water-efficient toilet fixtures. And um, in Luzon, we have the Via Verde located at Santo Tomas, Batangas. And the positive factor is the energy efficiency due to installation of solar panels in housing units. We also have the Linville residences at Lipa, Batangas. The positive factors are the daylight provision, natural ventilation, variable frequency drive for energy efficient devices, and their material recovery facility. Now in Visayas, we have the La Aldea del Mar, which is located at Lapu Lapu City, Cebu. The positive factors are the daylight provision, natural ventilation, and water efficient fixtures. And another project is the Blessed Sacrament Subdivision, still located at Lapu Lapu City, Cebu. The positive factors are energy efficiency due to installation of solar panels in housing units. And in Mindanao, we have the Filia Conchita, which is located at Davao City, Davao del Sur. So the positive factors are not natural ventilation, daylight provision, open space utilization, allocated water waste disposal, water efficient fixtures, energy efficient lighting fixtures, and their solid waste recycling. We also have Ventura Residences located at Cagayan de Oro City, Misamis Oriental. The positive factors are energy efficiency on wide windows, giving daylight provision and natural ventilation. And on its building envelope, they include glass properties on housing units. And another project in NCR, we have the Paseo Verde at Real. This is located at Las Piña City, and the positive factors are rainwater harvesting system, solar panel energy system, recycling facilities, and natural ventilation. We also have the CDC Millennium Ortegas at Pasig City. Uh, there are several positive, positive factors like building envelope, glass properties, natural ventilation, air conditioning system, frequency inverter technology on elevators, daylight provision windows, occupancy sensors for lighting control, energy efficient lighting fixtures, water efficient plumbing fixtures, vertical wall greening and gardens. And we also have the light residences at Mandaluyong City. So for here, there are also several um, green fixtures, which are considered positive factors. So they are also enumerated here in. And we also have the high, high phase two Tower C at Tai Tai Rizal. So again, there are a lot of green fixtures also for these projects, which are considered positive factors. And we also have Apple One Manawa Heights in Cebu. So um, the positive factors are energy efficiency, 
due to daylight provision and window openings and natural ventilation on condo units and use of water efficient fixtures. So that's all. Um, should you have questions about our Pagi Big Fund, Pagi Big Fund programs, you may call 724-4244. So thank you again for inviting us. And if you should, you should have uh, further questions, you may contact us at our website, pagibigfund.gov.ph. And also you may chat with us at www.pagibigfund.gov.ph. Thank you and have a good day, everyone. Thank you very much, Engineer Pabros. So we now move to our next speaker. So to discuss on green finance in real estate, we have Mr. Trey Archer, Business Development Director for Asia, Gresby, or the Global ESG Benchmark for Real Assets. Hello, everybody. Yeah, yes. just, just checking. Can everybody hear me okay? We can hear you, sir. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Well, hi, everybody. It's very nice to be here today. And, and thank you for the Philippine Green Building Council for inviting me here. It's great to speak with all of you. Um, so what we will be talking about today, um, well, the title of today's presentation is Green Finance and Real Estate, How Companies Use Gress to Make Sustainable Investments. Um, but before I get into that, I will just give a quick uh, introduction to myself and also my company, Gresp since today's presentation is really circled around how, um, how, how different investors and companies are using GRESS for green loans and also uh, green equity finance. Next slide, please. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Trey Archer and I'm the Business Development Director for Asia here at GRESP. Um, and I've been involved in ESG in Asia since 2016. Um, before taking on the role here at GRESP, um, I was the sales director for information based in Hong Kong. Next slide, please. Um, so for those who are not familiar with GRESP, um, what we do is assess and benchmark the ESG performance of real assets. And we are the world leader for ESG rating and benchmarking in the real asset space. So that would include infrastructure as well as real estate. Currently, we have 120,000 assets with 2,000 asset managers and developers from across 66 countries who, one, measure their ESG metrics from a company level and ask to improve their ESG score each year, two, benchmark their performance against their peers in the industry, and three, attract new investment opportunities from our 140 plus institutional investor members who use GRESP on a daily basis for manager selection and due diligence. Next slide, please. So how do we come up with this ESG score? Um, so really the easiest way that I describe GRESP is that we are an ESG report card. Um, so the same way that we get our report card in school is a very similar process to what we do at GRESP today. So the first step in getting that score is the first step, which is validation. So this would include an asset manager coming into our system, filling out the questionnaire, answering yes, ticking no, uploading supporting data, um, and completing the entire assessment. After that, GRESP, we're able to validate all of those answers to ensure they're correct. And then after doing that, we're able to give that company or that fund a score. After giving it a score, we're able to put them into a peer benchmark group where we can compare their score to peers and competitors in the market. Next slide, please. <clears throat> <clears throat> so you can see here, the, um, looking at the different types of scores we have, if you look on the left-hand side, you can see that 95 is highlighted in green. Um, so really the first score that you get at GRESP is your total score, and that score is 1 out of 100, 100 being the highest. 
if you look on the right hand side you can see that we have a five green star rating system so if your total GRESP score is in the top 20 percent globally you would get five green stars which is the highest ranking any company can get if you're in the top 40 percent you get four green stars um, top 60 percent three green stars etc cetera, etc cetera. and then you can see in the middle part of our scorecard you can see that we have our benchmark group. Um, so if you look at the benchmark group for this company, the group we've put them into is called United States of America Office Corporate Listed Companies. So out of all of the companies that report to GRESS that fall into this category of USA Office Corporate Listed, there are 13. And out of the 13 companies, this company, Kilroy Realty, they scored first out of 13. So they scored number one in their benchmark group. So you can see just right here, we have several types of rankings, um, benchmarking groups that um, investors are able to use to make more informed ESG investment decisions. And we're gonna look at that in just a, um, uh, a bit later on in this presentation, but just wanted to give all of you an overview of, of really the GREF scorecard since it's really vital to, to not only GRESS but also the key pillars of this conversation. Next slide, please. So if you look exactly what is in GRESS, what is on our assessment, um, what we've done is quite innovative and unique. We've taken some of the world's most prominent ESG frameworks, everything from CDP to TCFD to SASB, and we've taken the bits and pieces of these that are most relevant to infrastructure and real estate, and we've incorporated those into our assessment. So that does several things for all of our participants. One, it saves them a lot of time. So instead of having to report to all of these frameworks, you can really streamline or you can really tick the boxes of many of those by doing GRESP. Two, it saves you on cost instead of having to pay for all each and every single one of these frameworks. It um, allows you to streamline that process through GRESP. And then last but not least, it also saves our participants from over-reporting or double-reporting, which is quite a big problem in ESG today since there's so many frameworks out there uh, to choose from. <clears throat> since what we've realized is a lot of the questions in some of these frameworks are similar or in some cases even the same. So in those cases, we've taken those questions, consolidated them into one, so you only have to answer it one time. Actually, on another note as well, <clears throat> having this system being a framework of frameworks, this is also very good for companies who are starting their ESG journey. <clears throat> so again, a big problem is a lot of the ESG frameworks out there, it's really become an alphabet soup, and it's quite confusing to know where to begin or what to follow. But since GRESP has picked the bits and pieces of the ones that are most relevant to real estate and infrastructure, it's really a great way to be able to align your company to the ones that are most relevant for our industry. So GRESP is really good for those that are just starting their ESG journey, since we're able to point them into the right direction of what to follow and what is most important. Next slide, please. So who is doing GRESP? Um, so there's two main types of GRESP members. Um, on the participant side, that would be the asset managers or the fund managers. So you can see here in real estate, there's one assessment that all real estate companies take. And on the infrastructure side, there's two, one for infrastructure funds and one for infrastructure assets. <clears throat> so for any company that do, or any asset manager that does GRESP, let's say they're a real estate company, they would go in, do the GRESP real estate assessment and answer all of the questions. And then after that, we're able to give them their score their benchmark score, their five green star rating, et cetera. Next slide, please. On the other hand of our membership, we have our investor members. So as you can see here, we have more than 140 of the world's top institutional investors. And the way that these investors use, uh, so, sorry, go back to the, the previous slide, please. So the way that these investors use GRESP is to get more transparency into their assets and asset managers. 
So if you take um, an example, well, if you look at some of these, you can see that um, a, a lot of these uh, institutional investors are getting so much pressure from their stakeholders and from their governments and from their populations that they operate in to make more sustainable investments. So the best way that they found is to use GRESP specifically for real estate and real assets to be able to get that transparency necessary to understand if they are making sustainable investments or not. So what you're seeing, companies such as APG or CPPIB, they're actually requiring their, their um, asset uh, managers to do GRESP, um, specifically in the case of APG, they'll say, we will not invest in your company or fund unless you do GRESP first. So you're really seeing a lot of these investors taking a proactive uh, approach to GRESP uh, to do more within sustainability to make more sound investments. Next slide, please. So you can see that the way that all works from an ESG point of view, you have our institutional investors at the top and they use GRESP to get more transparency into their assets and asset managers. And then at the bottom, you see that we have our asset managers who use GRESP to not only get an ESG score so that they can improve their score year after year, but also to be able to compare that score to peers and competitors in the market via benchmarking. However, at the same time, there is a business development component to GRESP. <clears throat> and this is really the, what we're going to look at in detail in just a second. Um, but let's say if we have a big institutional investor, say APG, who's looking to make more investments into Philippine real estate. What they can do is they can go through our portal to see all of the different companies that operate in that space. Um, and then from there, they can click a button to see their GRESP score and their, their, their assessment. After reviewing their assessment, they can decide if this is the type of company that they would like to invest with or not to see if that if they are indeed making a sustainable investment with this manager. And then from there, they can click another button to speak and connect with that manager. And then from there, they can discuss new investment opportunities. So GRESP is not only a way to be more ESG compliant, something that's better for the environment and future generations, but it's also a great way to improve your bottom line since we're able to connect uh, managers and investors directly with each other for new investment opportunities. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So that really brings us to kind of the, um, the, the main part of our conversation today, looking at how different companies are using GRESP to make more ESG compliant investments. Um, and that really falls into two categories. The first one we're gonna look at is sustainability linked loans, or in other words, green loans. So you have many banks um, and lenders out there who are using GRESP to be able to make more uh, sustainability linked investment decisions. And what a green loan is, um, by definition, it is any type of loan instruments and or contingent facilities, such as bonding lines, guarantee lines, or letters of credit, which incentivize the borrower's achievement of ambitious, predetermined sustainability performance objectives. So let's take a look at some examples. Next slide, please. So some of the many case studies that we've seen at GRESP, um, we'll highlight a few. Um, the one we're looking at here involves Keppel Land and also DP, DBS. Um, so what happened in this case was um, the loan that DBS provided Keppel Land incorporates interest rate reductions linked to predetermined ESG targets allowing Keppel Land to enjoy savings and borrowing cost. So these include Keppel Land achieving a five-star rating in the 2021 GRESP real estate assessment. So what happened here is DBS and Keppel Land um, negotiated terms on their loans that DPS would give Keppel Land a discount on their interest rate if they're able to achieve certain ESG link KPIs. Next slide, please. One of the KPIs was achieving that GRESP five-star rating. So if you remember, the five-star green rating is the highest that we offer at GRESP. Um, since Keppel Land was able to achieve that in GRESP, DBS actually reduced their interest rate by a certain amount. 
So you can see this is a perfect example of how green loans work. It actually allows different developers or property managers out there to have lower cost of capital while at the same time being ESG compliant. Next slide, please. Another example involves UOB and Capital Land. So Capital Land has a, obtained a 500 million Singapore dollar sustainability link loan from UOB. So this loan, it's the largest sustainability link bilateral loan in Singapore's real estate sector ever. The sustainability link loan is explicitly linked to Capital Land's achievements in GRESP, which is the leading benchmark for real assets and investments across the world. So again, you can see here, this is another example of how companies are using GRESP, or how, or I should say, how banks are using GRESP uh, for sustainability linked loans. Um, so there was, um, so, uh, next slide, please. So you can see that um, what, what um, uh, UOB and Capital Land discussed or in their negotiations for the sustainability link loan is um, looking at different metrics within the GRESP assessment. So the last slide that we saw that involved DBS, um, they were looking at high level scores. So your five star rating, really an overall score of how you've done on GRESP. But you can see that um, other banks are looking at different metrics as well. In the case of this example, looking at individual metrics within the GRESP assessment. So the final GRESP assessment, it's more than 160 pages long. So there are many different metrics that banks can look at. But one of the most important that we're seeing today are in terms of um, greenhouse gas emissions. So some of the metrics that are being examined are looking specifically at how companies are reducing their GHG emissions over time. So again, looking at this example, one example that we can see different um, lenders um, 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 discussing with their, um, with their banks uh, is to be able to say, if you are able to reduce your energy emissions by a certain percentage, then we will lower the interest rate of your loan by, um, by X percent as well. So you can see another example how companies are achieving lower cost of capital all by being ESG compliant, all via GRESP at the same time. So you can see ESG and, and is really just a great way not only to do something good for the planet, but again, it's also a great way to lower your cost of capital. Next slide, please. So let's look at a few other examples. Um, so there's, we just looked at the green loan side, um, but let's look at it from an equity point of view as well. Um, so green equity investing, the definition of that is to support business practices that have a favorable impact on the natural environment, often grouped with socially responsible investing or ESG criteria. Green investments focus on companies or projects committed to the conservation of natural resources, pollution reduction, or other environmentally conscious business practices. So again, very similar to what we saw with green loans. It's a very similar concept, except it involves equity investments. Next slide, please. So looking at a few examples of our case studies, um, one that we can examine is from Heitman, which is a, a large real estate investment management firm. Um, so the way that Heitman uses GRESP is to compare various REITs and companies against their peer groups within a country, listed performance benchmarks to find trends and outliers, and to apply the data to further lines of questioning. So the other examples we saw involved looking at individual metrics, um, specifically from a GHG reduction point of view, and also a more high level point of view by looking at a company's um, GRESP five-star rating. Next slide, please. However, this example is really focusing on the benchmark group. So this is something that Heitman has really highlighted as something that is important for them. Being able to go in, examine a company's benchmark group to see how they compare against peers and competitors in their market. Um, and the benchmark is quite important. So I'm sure as many of you realize that different companies, or I should say really different countries, have adopted ESG at different rates. 
So if you have a large investor that is looking to make investments, um, let's say into Myanmar, um, it would be unfair for them to compare <clears throat> those companies in Myanmar to companies in the Netherlands, especially since the Netherlands has adopted ESG at a much faster rate than Myanmar. Um, and there's even laws and different things in the Never Netherlands that promote ESG or really require ESG. So you're not really comparing apples to apples in that sense. And this is why the benchmark comes into play and it's so important. But using the benchmark, you're able to compare apples to apples. You're able to compare Southeast Asian companies with Southeast Asian companies or Burmese companies with Burmese companies um, so that you're really able to compare them on a level based on that country's adoption of ESG. And this is something that Heitman has used um, um, quite extensively when making their ESG investment decisions with Crest participants is to really focus on their benchmark to make sure they are comparing across the board equally in the regions that they're operating in. Next slide, please. Another example is BI Capital. Uh, so as ESG has evolved from being primarily a client consideration to a regulatory necessity, the firm BNI Capital introduced a negative screen to enter um, its entire investment universe following the do not harm principles of the EU's SFDR regulation. So to manage this feat and to protect the bottom line, BNI Capital leverages its GRESP investor membership to gain a more detailed understanding of relevant environmental and social factors across the listed real estate space. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what, what BNI is mostly focusing on, um, obviously a lot of the factors we've looked at in GRESP do have to do with the environmental side, um, specifically within greenhouse gas emissions, energy consumption, water consumption, et cetera. Um, but Heitman is even taking it a step further since they're not only looking at the environmental factors within the GRESP assessment, but also the social and governance factors as well. So I know when ESG is talked about, it most, most people are concerned with the E, the environmental side, but what we're actually seeing at GRESP is that there's more and more companies are placing emphasis on social and governance as well. Um, so it is important to remember that there are three letters in ESG. Um, all are important. The S and G are becoming more and more important um, even though E is kind of the, the main star of the show at the moment. Um, but looking at this example, when BNI Capital is looking to make uh, more investment decisions, they are using the GRESP assessment to evaluate not only the E, but the S and the G as well. So you can see that many investors and lenders out there are using GRESP in many different ways to make investment decisions. Um, again, and this is something that's good for everybody. It allows the investor to make more sustainability smart investments, while at the same time, it allows participants to not only, or the asset managers, I should say, to not only be ESG compliant, but also to increase their bottom line by having lower cost of capital through loans and also more in, uh, equity injections through investors. Next slide, please. So if that wasn't enough, um, just looking at a few other case studies um, from independent companies outside of GRESP. Um, so there's actually many case studies out there that have proven that companies who use GRESP have higher valuations, lower cost of capital, et cetera. Um, so just looking at a few of these independent case studies, um, one is titled Sustainability and Private Equity, Real Estate Returns. Um, and this is by Avis Devine, Andrew Sanderford, and Chong Yu Wang. And this is an excerpt from page four and page five, um, looking at the quote, recent work on REITs reveals that firms reporting to GRESP tend to have lower costs of debt and higher valuations. Next slide, please. Case study number two is titled Influence of ESG Factors on Performance of Private Equity Real Estate Finds in Asia Pacific. And this is by Jesslyn Ng Yu Xuan, and this is a page two excerpt, which states, using proprietary data from the Asian Association for Investors in Non-Listed Real Estate Vehicles, i.e. ANREV, and the Global Real Estate Sustainability Benchmark, i.e. GRESP, this study confirmed the main hypothesis set out that ESG factors are positively correlated 
with fund performance with a basic regression performed revealing that fund returns improved by 0.852% for every 10 point increase in overall ESG score. Next slide, please. So conclusion, um, so number one, participating in GRESP and improving your ESG performance will provide you with lower cost of capital and higher valuations. So we've seen that with some of the case studies from our investor members, but also from the independent case studies that we just spoke about. Number two, GRESP participation gives you an advantage over competitors for investors deciding on capital allocation. So again, as mentioned, there are many investors out there who are starting to declare that they will not invest in your real estate company or fund unless you do GRESS first. So already that is able to set you apart from other peers in your market just by doing GRESP um, or compared to those who are not doing GRESP since they won't have a chance at even um, being at the table for investment discussions until they do GRESP first. And then last but not least, um, ESG makes the planet a better place for our children and our grandchildren, specifically in terms of equality and also um, carbon emissions. So by looking at all three of these factors, it's, uh, it's really a no-brainer. What's not to like about ESG? It allows you to increase the bottom line at your company while also making the world a better place for future generations. And that's something that, in personally, my opinion, is so great about ESG is that it's really a win-win scenario for everybody. Next slide, please. All right, so that is it for today's presentation. Um, thank you all very much for your time. Um, and feel free to send me any questions uh, via email if, if you have any. So thank you again. Thank you very much, Mr. Archer. So may I invite our speakers to turn on your cameras and join us for the open forum for this episode. As mentioned earlier, you may send your questions for our speakers using the questions box. So there. <laughs> So we have with us Mr. Uh, Nolly Cruz from DBP, Mr. Ronaldo Averion from Land Bank, uh, Ms. Uh, Engineer Imelda Fabros will be joining us uh, via audio, and we have also Mr. Trey Archer from GRASP. Okay, so let's start with the questions for Mr. Trey Archer of GRASP. Um, there's a question here, how has GRASP been used in the Philippines and based in your experience in the region, what are key drivers for developers or property managers to disclose their sustainability performance or to pursue sustainability targets for their buildings? Sure. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so the Philippines is still very much a, a, a growth market for us. Um, we have had Ayala land participate in the past. Um, Robinson's Land is another participant for GRESP. Um, but what we see, the Philippines is a bit behind when compared to other countries in the region, such as Japan and Australia, who are really, um, well, it, it really recently have become world leaders in, in ESG, um, but also secondary markets in APAC, such as um, Hong Kong and Singapore, which are, which are quickly catching up to the, the leaders, such as Japan and Australia and APAC. Um, but we are seeing a lot of renewed interest, not only within the Philippines, but all throughout Southeast Asia, um, India and China as well have become key growth markets as well, seeing a lot of new participants um, um, coming out of those countries also. Um, actually, India was our number one um, new business market um, in APAC for this year. Um, so that's exciting to see, but we're also seeing a lot of uh, new upticks in Southeast Asia as well. Um, some of the, the biggest um, factors that are encouraging different companies, not only in Asia, but all over across the world, um, it really goes back to that bottom line, um, is that GRESS is a, it's an investment. Um, and like any good investment, you can actually have a good return on your investment when done properly. Um, so really the whole point of the, the presentation that I just spoke about was showing that GRESP is not only a great way to be ESG compliant, which is something, again, it's great for future generations and it's great for the planet, but it's also good for your bottom line. 
since investors are specifically looking to make investments based off of gross criteria. And again, a lot of these investors or banks won't use, um, will not invest or make loans to companies unless they use Crest first in some cases. Um, so by looking at that, um, it gives a big economic incentive for a lot of companies to come to us, say they want to do Crest because their investors are requesting it. But you also see a lot of real estate companies coming to us saying that they want to attract new investment and they understand from some of their peers in the market that by doing Crest, this is a great way to be able to attract um, new, new investment from new investors. And, and, and sorry, what was, what, I, I think that was the first part of the question. Was there a second part to that question as well? Or? So, sorry, Chester, I can't hear you. Yeah, the, the, the next part is uh, based on your experience in the region. What are the key drivers for developers or the property managers to disclose their sustainability performance or to pursue green uh, or sustainability targets for their buildings? Okay, great. Yeah, so so I think that that also goes back to um, um, what I was just saying as well. So the key driver is um, it, it goes back to being a good return on investment. So companies, they, they're willing to report to GRESP to disclose the data. Um, because they realize that this is a great way to be selected by investors um, um, compared to those who aren't doing GRESP, but it's also a great way for them to attract new investors as well just by doing GRESP. So it all goes back to a return on investment. Thank you for that, Mr. Archer. So the, the next question is for all the, of the speakers. Uh, the question is based on your programs. How is the uptake of green buildings in the country? And are these are there specific tar segments in the industry that utilize green financing programs more than others? For example, commercial office developers versus affordable housing developers. I guess we can start with uh, DBP, Sir Nolly. Sir? Hi, uh, Chester. Thank you for the question. Uh, well, uh, I would say we are still on the outlier uh, situation because we, we're just uh, recovering from the pandemic or no, from the effects of the pandemic. And the priority of most businesses is really focused on, uh, you know, reco business recovery. And uh, but I see some uh, movement no, in so far as the investing in uh, green buildings. Uh, there are a lot of interest, but uh, mostly on energy efficiency. And that would be on the commercial side. And uh, I'm also looking at the use of the renewable energy, uh, particularly on uh, uh, solar rooftop. Uh, that's something uh, of interest because of the increasing, uh, of course, cost of electricity and to be competitive as well. Ernoli, uh, how yes. about from Bank Bank? Yeah. Hi, uh, so I see uh, the movement uh, is still in its, uh, I would consider it, it's in, in its uh, infancy stage. And the uh, good thing about um, the players in the industry, the banks, the developers, um, and other um, parties, uh, we are in this together. And um, all players are coordinating. We have the certifications. Uh, we have um, parties that has uh, that have totally that are totally invested in this endeavor um, one thing with banks and not only uh, DBP and land bank I think uh, I believe that the private commercial banks are also heavily uh, invested in this um, green building uh, advocacy so Although, as I mentioned, we're still at the, there's still much to be desired. I think um, we are all uh, heading to the right direction. Thank you, Mr. Averion. Uh, how about uh, from Pag-ibig Fund, ma'am? Yeah, again, yes, sir. Uh, since Pag-ibig Fund uh, caters to um, housing, so I would I, I would say that um, a lot of uh, subdivision uh, projects have already adopted uh, green features in their projects. So as I mentioned a while ago, there are a lot of uh, 
projects already caught uh, all over the, the country uh, adapting uh, features like energy efficiency, waste, uh, waste management, uh, water efficiency, and uh, site sustainability features in their projects. And uh, because of this, we have already given out also premiums in our valuations um, to recognize the adoption of these green features. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Archer, would you like to share your insights on, on, the, on the question? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, so uh, very similar to what some of the other speakers have said. So it, it is in its infancy. Um, however, we are starting to see um, a, a, actually a, a slight in uh, increase in growth. And I think it is correct that since the pandemic is is hopefully in its final year, um, we, we are starting to see that renewed interest um, and really um, kind of these type of inquiries pick up not only in the Philippines, but all throughout ASEAN as well. Um, but one thing that we have been seeing at GRESP, um, so we have adopted Verde as one of our uh, green building certificates. Um, so when we do do, or I guess any company that is um, has signed up for Verde, they will be able to get points in GRESP as well. Um, so a lot of people think that GRESP is, um, only looks at uh, metrics from a global level. Um, that's not necessarily true. Um, we also look at um, localized green building certificates, such as Verde, such as some of the other ones, um, to make sure that companies are um, not only following international standards, but also local standards as well. Um, so the fact that we have incorporated a, a few of the um, kind of localized Philippine green building certificates and other schemes as well into our assessment, um, I think just goes to show that we are starting to see that there is uh, enough uh, increased interest um, that we're starting to pay more attention to the Philippine market. Thank you, Mr. Archer, especially for mentioning that uh, about incorporating um, Verde in a grass certification. Um, that, uh, with that also, I'd like to ask our banks and our financial institutions, so is green building certification, such as Advancing Net Zero and Verde green building certification encouraged or required as you go for the evaluation process? For securing a green loan. Let's start with uh, Sir Rustico Nolly Cruz of DBP. Sir? Yeah, Chester, I think it's a quick yes. No, uh, That's very important that we have that certification. It provides comfort to the bank no, to approve loans. Uh, at least there are association or council that is looking at uh, standards. No, uh, I think most banks no, would uh, agree on that uh, if it is based on standard and it uh, qualifies, no, uh, at least the technical risk no, is already covered on the part of the bank. And we are more comfortable to finance that project with a bare the certification and so on. Thank you, sir. Uh, how about for the case of Land Bank? Uh, yes, is I this... totally agree with uh, Mr. Uh, Vice President Molly Cruz. Uh, it would certainly help and it would certainly add um, comfort for banks if uh, there's uh, birth certification and other certification that would uh, give the bank's preference to the loan application. So is, it's, it's not necessarily a requirement, but it will be, uh, or it is highly encouraged because it will be easier or faster for one to get a good valuation for your application correct yes it is not a requirement but um, I, I guess the better question would be what would be the benefit if there's birth certification for example well we can see this as to um, we can look at it on the preference point of view so maybe we can uh, put some level of preference uh, if a loan application has a uh, birth certification and uh, probably just probably uh, we can also look at it uh, from the point of view of the interest rate if, if i may uh tester yes sir Apa. yeah for us uh, i think in the design of our new program it would be a requirement that there's certain certification uh from a council or an association no, for that matter to, as I mentioned, that would uh, provide comfort for us to approve loan. And uh, that certification is very important for us. So it's a requirement for DBP. Yeah. 
Thank you, Mr. Cruz. How about for uh, Pag-ibig Fund, ma'am? To yeah, encourage... I, you are correct, Mr. when you said that it is not a requirement, uh, but uh, certainly it would be um, a plus factor if there is a certification. Thank you. Chester, can, we can't hear you. Sorry, sorry. Thank you. So the next question goes for everyone. So how important is sustainable finance in terms of the bank's general climate change or net zero strategy? And let's start again with DBP. Yeah, sure. well, thank you again, uh, Chester. Well, uh, very important. No? When we talk about sustainable finance, we're talking about the future. No, It's the, well, we're meeting the present and without compromising the needs of the future generation. No? So that's that's very important. Second point, I think in the business side, no, we're looking at already transition and physical risk. And therefore, we really have to do our part in addressing those risks. No? And banking is about managing risks. And therefore, uh, we really, really have to address those things. No, so the the question about uh, how important it is it is very important. No, uh, it's the general direction of the I think the entire you know the world. No, is uh, really working on uh, achieving the COP uh, 26. Especially we as a government, no, we adhere to the uh, NDC nationally determined uh, contribution of the country. As mentioned in my presentation a while ago, we are supporting the Philippine government's trust, and thus, the, you know, uh, the attainment of that uh, is something that we wholeheartedly supported, no, uh, up to this present, and that's why we have a lot of uh, sustainable finance programs uh, available. Okay, thank you. Back to you, Chester. Thank you, Sir Cruz, uh, from Land Bank, sir. You like to share uh, that, uh, I think uh, for decades, for decades now, has committed itself towards the improvement of the environment. And uh, I would like to share that uh, two years ago, Land Bank issued sustainable bonds. Uh, so this, uh, the proceeds of the sustainable bonds was uh, um, used uh, for projects related to environment and other um, loan products that are all related to environment. And uh, the, the, the issuance has been oversubscribed by about five times. So I can, probably you can, you can imagine the commitment, uh, not only of landmark, but of the investing public um, on projects such as this one. And uh, for the next decades to come, landmark will surely be still uh, at the forefront of um, environment protection, sustainability, and everything related to it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. For Pag-ibig Fund, uh, Engineer Pabros. And sir? Yes, ma'am. Same question. How important is sustainable finance in terms of a bank's general climate change or net zero strategy? Okay. Um, I think this, uh, sustainable financing is very important because it would um, um, it would make it possible for for projects, especially in our case in housing, to to adopt um, green features. So it would make um, it to make it easier for proponents to to uh, perpetuate their advocacy in adopting um, uh, environment friendly pictures in their housing uh, projects, and it would make also it would also make uh, it more affordable for the entities if they will be financed uh, affordably. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. So. Next, we have uh, a question. Uh, I guess this is for everyone's uh, to share their input. Now, um, for the case of regulatory frameworks, this can help in the promotion of green financing. In your opinion, are the country's regulatory policies sufficient to boost financing and investments in green? 
which regulations are helpful and what do you think are areas where uh, these regulations are lacking? Uh, perhaps you can start with uh, inputs from uh, Trey Archer. Certainly, um, there's always room to improve. Um, so I think if you look at some, um, some uh, l looking at kind of other markets out there, if you take Singapore, for example, um, they're really doing a lot to, to push forward a green agenda, um, specifically within the SGX. So companies looking to list on the SGX are under more and more scrutiny to comply with uh, different ESG related matters. Um, I know as of now, the, the Singapore Stock Exchange looks at many different ESG frameworks, GRESS being one of them, as something that they will count as um, something uh, compliant to list on their stock exchange. Uh, but again, they're always looking to do more. Um, so I think if you look at Sing Singapore really being a leader in all of ASEAN or really all of Asia in that matter for taking on a green agenda, um, I think all other countries can really look at that and use as a framework to more implement more policy to try to encourage more um, asset managers, more investors, banks, et cetera, to make more sustainable investment uh, or lending decisions. Um, that being said, I, uh, going back to what I first said, I always think that there, there can be more. So even in a leader like Singapore, there's still much, much more that they can do, um, especially when you're comparing them to maybe some of the other countries in Europe who are just launched something such as SFDR, which is going to make um, um, a, a lot of new waves within the uh, investment community in Europe regarding ESG. Um, so yeah, always, always more to be done, but at the same time, it is a baby step process that takes time. Thank you, Mr. Archer. Uh, Mr. Cruz, would you like to share on uh, regulations in the country, which ones you think are helpful and where er uh, areas that are lacking, sir? Well, uh, yeah, thank you. The, well, there are already a lot of regulations in the country, I would say. Uh, if we talk about uh, promoting more of uh, climate mitigation okay. projects, we have the Republic Act, uh, I forgot the RE law, no? Uh, and then we have also the 11285, the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Act. So those are in place, no? Uh, in so far as uh, RE, I think uh, there's a lot of interest. It's just the mechanism on how to further encourage investment uh, that is affecting it. But I think uh, we are in the right direction because of the auction and there's a lot of interest now going on in developing utility scale RE. Now on energy efficiency, it's more really of, uh, I think, uh, enforcement because I believe there is a designated entity required to uh, reduce uh, electricity consumption at certain uh, uh, quantity. And uh, if they're, they are a covered entity, then uh, you know, you, you'll see a lot of uh, interest in, ter in terms of investment to maybe even green building no? so that they could also meet their uh, compliances to the regulations. So yeah, in so far as regulatory framework, plus of course for banks, no, we have, uh, I think in 2020, uh, the Banco Central ng Pilipinas issued the uh, BSP Circular 1085, which is the Sustainable Finance Framework, and that uh, requires bank to transition. Uh, that's the ESG being uh, mentioned and espoused by Archer here. Uh, that is something already uh, being embedded by all uh, BSP supervised financial institutions. So in three years, uh, we're looking at up to uh, 2023 no, to mm -hmm. comply. Uh, in terms of the transition to a uh, sustainable finance framework. Thank you, sir. Uh, how about from Pag-ibig Fund, Engineer Pabros? Sir, I'm sorry, I, I'm having technical problems here. I, I get, uh, I don't, I didn't clearly uh, get the question. I had, I got disconnected a while ago. Yes, ma'am. Um, in, in terms of uh, regulatory uh, regulations or policies that, uh, that are helpful for the promotion of green financing, um, which ones do you think are very helpful and uh, what areas do you think are lacking in terms of regulations? Okay. Um, that's what I have um, in my presentation. We are... Uh, we are banking or we are depending on the 
the provisions of the Philippine Green Building Code, so uh, which is also a requirement in giving out the building permit. So as a financing uh, corporation, uh, we rely uh, on, on the uh, compliances of the projects that we finance on these goods. So, six Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Aberion, uh, Land Bank, sir. Yes, I would like to take off from what Trey has mentioned earlier about the baby steps. And I would say that baby steps is better than no steps at all. So, um, so with that, I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're heading towards the right direction. And if I may just share, um, for banks, I, uh, DBP and uh, Landmark has attended um, a, a workshop, um, I think a month before, uh, and one of the speakers from uh, Banco Central has uh, shared that about this plan of the SP, not to encourage, but to impose um, certain uh, imposing uh, for banks to allot um, a, a portion of its loanable fund for energy efficiency. So this is similar to um, the imposition uh, mm -hmm. of for banks to allot a portion of its loanable funds for, uh, say, uh, agri agra loans. But this time, this would be for energy efficiency. Or uh, instead of um, agri agra loans, um, loans for energy efficiency would qualify um, as um, under the requirements of the agri agra loan. Because the, under the agri agra loan, banks are required to 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 allocate a certain portion of its loadable funds for agriculture and uh, for agriculture and uh, for those uh, who are for those banks who are not able to 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 loan uh, its funds for that purpose. Uh, its loans for uh, energy efficiency would qualify in that aspect. So I think it's a it's a good move um, on the part of BSP and as well as uh, the banks would be I, I believe would be it would be easier for uh, the banks, especially private banks, uh, to comply uh, if the loans would be uh, provided for energy efficiency. Uh, that's good to know, sir. I, I, I guess that would be really helpful, especially for property developers to have greater re number of resources to 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 be available for them to access. Um, I guess this is the la that is the last question for this morning. Chester, yes, sir. Chester, if I may add, I think uh, if that is there is something lacking, no, uh, it's really more of the climate adaptation. Because uh, most investment uh, worldwide, I would say, is really skewed towards uh, climate mitigation. Uh, perhaps adaptation uh, should also be boosted so that you know uh, investment uh, could also be poured in. No? Unfortunately, uh, not all uh, climate adaptation projects are revenue generating. It's really more of social services. No? So perhaps uh, you know something has to be done in in that. Uh, area uh, so that sustainable finance uh, it's not only about uh, climate mitigation it's also about adaptation especially you know we are in the super we're experiencing super typhoon as we speak no and therefore really climate adaptation should really be mainstream and uh, and help the community to adapt no? to the current situation the vulnerability of the different areas to climate change so that's it thank you chester all right, just, I, I got to just to, that question. Yeah. Actually, yeah, j just to add on to that. So when, when I was speaking about kind of looking at different adoptions, I, I totally agree with you. Um, but you're starting to see other um, really countries out there adopting TCFD, which focuses exclusively on, on climate mitigation, climate risk, et cetera. Um, so kind of looking at the future, I'm, I'm, I would hope that's something that um, many other markets will adopt in the future of making it something even mandatory. Um, I know that's not something you can do overnight, but I do think TCFD is actually a great uh, framework in really um, helping mitigate climate risk. So um, I, I totally agree with you on that one. Good point. 
Thank you, Mr. Archer. Actually, Sir uh, Sir Nolly, I got curious. Now, do you have specific uh, suggestions in mind, sir? <laughs> well, well, right now, no. It's really more uh, under under. I mean, the project that we're funding for adaptation is undertaken by uh, LGUs, no. So. Uh, I think private sector participation in that area also would be important. No? Uh, but uh, again, maybe given some incentives or some regulations, no, uh, that could uh, uh, increase investment. No? Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So that, that I guess is the, the end of the discussion. Thank you for participating in the discussions. For our participants, for our attendees, if you have further questions for our speakers, please contact the Phil GBC National Secretariat at bg2022 at philgbc.org so we can coordinate with our speakers after the event. Thank you once again to all our speakers from the Development Bank of the Philippines, Land Bank, Pag-ibig Fund, and Nesp. Thank you, Mr. Archer, uh, Mr. Nolly Cruz, Mr. Averion, and Engineer. Fabrous. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very yes. much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, PDPC. Thank you. So thank you to all our participants for joining us for episode 13, the green financing. Later this afternoon at 1:30 p.m. Uh, is episode 14, the advancing net zero where the Phil GBC will provide updates from the Advancing Net Zero Philippines ANZPH program. NEO Property Management will showcase their portfolio of Advancing Net Zero uh, PH uh, certified projects and share the programs and strategies they implemented to achieve Advancing Net Zero Philippines five stars and Net Zero Energy certification. Technical presentations that incorporate energy conservation and optimization practices and strategies use of renewable sources of energy for buildings and communities will also be highlight, highlighted during the episode. So register now and join us later for episode 14, The Advancing Net Zero. At 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. tomorrow is episode 15, Advancing Net Zero PH Professionals is a uh, green... It's a green, uh, Building Green 2022 training episode for the accreditation of professionals for the Advancing Net Zero Philippines certification program. Bill GBC developed the Advancing Net Zero Philippines professionals training course to increase the capability of professionals and project proponents in implementing net zero energy projects. The, the comprehensive online training on Advancing Net Zero Philippines version 1.1.0 includes a background on sustainability in buildings, in-depth discussion on net zero principles, and the Advancing Net Zero Philippines Advancing Net Zero Energy Rating Scheme. The exam for this is scheduled on September 29, Thursday at 2 p.m. Individuals who complete the course and pass the qualifying exam will be recognized as ANZPH accredited professionals. For our build, for our final uh, BG 2022 conference episode, please register and join us for BG 2022 episode 16, the closing. Phil GBC will officially close BG 2022 and the Green Building Month celebration in this episode. We will be sharing with you the highlights of this year's Building Green 2022. So please scan the QR codes for each episode to register or contact the Phil GBC National Secretariat through BG2022 at philgbc.org for more information. To officially close this episode, we have Ms. Catherine Ilagan, a member of the Phil GBC Board of Trustees and President and CEO of Phil Invest Alabang Inc. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. We hope you found episode 13 on green financing helpful in understanding better how our government has also been championing the growth of the green building industry and the various options we can explore to finance our projects. Those of you who have been in the industry longer may recall that years ago, even if there was already a global recognition of the harmful effects of climate change, 
there was still apprehension in developing sustainable products. Business owners weren't sure if it was worth it to finance these projects and if the market could bear the resulting price premiums. The Philippines has come a long way since then, and now we have the public and private sector working together to support developments that espouse climate responsiveness and resilience. The Department of Finance and the Banco Central ng Pilipinas have also rolled out their frameworks for green financing in response to the country's sustainable development goals. We at the PhilGBC are quite proud to be one of the platforms that help raise awareness related to this. We thank our speakers for sharing their expertise and insights. Mr. Rustico Noli Cruz, Vice President and Head of Program Development and Management Department of the Development Bank of the Philippines, Mr. Ronald Averion, Program Officer, Program Management Department of the Land Bank of the Philippines, Engineer Maria Imelda Pabros, Department Manager 3, Property Valuation Department of Pag-ibig Fund, and Mr. Trey Archer, Business Development Director for Asia, GRESD, Global ESG Benchmark for Real Assets. We hope their presentations inspire you to invest in greener developments and that you take advantage of their financing instruments to scale up your growth in the market. Our past few episodes have focused on the various PhilGBC certification programs. We invite you to use the latest versions for your projects. Please feel free to visit verdeonline.org for more information on Verde buildings and Verde districts, anzph.org for information on the Advancing Net Zero Philippines Certification Program, and healthph.org for health and well-being for buildings. Building Green 2022 would not have been possible without the continued support of our sponsors. Our gold strategic partners, NIO, Aboitis Infra Capital Economic Estates, and City Homes Builders and Development, Inc. Silver Strategic Partners, Wall Vision Corporation, Daikin Air Conditioning Philippines, Inc., and First Balfour, Inc. Our Bronze Strategic Partners, Monocrete Construction Philippines, Inc., Botanica Nature Residences, Philinda City, FPD Asia, AGC Asia Pacific Private Limited, and DTEM Incorporated. We thank you for your steadfast partnership with the PhilGBC. While we are nearing the end of our conference, we still have a few more episodes packed with information and insight. Please continue to join us for episode 14, The Advancing Net Zero, which is later today at 1.30 p.m. Episode 15, The Professionals, ANZPH, which is tomorrow, September 27, at 8 a.m. for the Advancing Net Zero Philippines Professionals Training Course. And our BG 2022 Final Conference episode, Episode 16, The Closing, which is on Friday, September 30, 2022, at 10 a.m. We encourage everyone to visit philgbc.org for more information or contact the PhilGBC National Secretariat at bg2022 at philgbc.org. Once again, thank you everyone for your participation in Building Green 2022, Episode 13, The Green Financing. Have a pleasant afternoon.